We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Maya Romano. Uh, forgive me, it's, uh, I'm in Canada, so it's the middle of the night here in case things appear a little dark. Um, it's really lovely to have everybody here to discuss this uh, important edition of Giz Watch that we've put out. So I just want to welcome everybody for joining us. Um, we have an excellent group of speakers today from the broader Giz Watch community and from different sectors of society. And a warm welcome and thank you for connecting to the session. Um, shortly, we'll also have Valeria Betancourt joining us. Uh, Valeria is the manager of APC's communications and information policy program here at APC, uh, which is responsible for the publication of Gizwatch. We also have Alan Finley, who is our longtime editor of Gizwatch for these past 15 years. So um, I see Valer Valeria has joined us. So I'm going to turn it over to Valeria to give us a few um, introductory remarks, and then she will uh, turn it over to Alan and to our participants. Welcome, Valeria. Thank you very much, Maya, and apologies, everyone. Technology always plays tricks <laughs> sometimes. Uh, okay, so um, welcome to this session. We have usually launched the editions of our Global Information Society Watch in the IGF, and even though this year we have published the current edition at the, at the beginning of the second quarter of 2021, we did not want to miss the opportunity to draw on the challenges, successes, responses identified in this 2020 edition, and also to connect it with the various conversations happening in the IGF around environmental sustainability. But before I introduce this specific edition, let me just briefly mention that the, the Global Information Society Watch is a platform that provides critical civil society perspectives on the state of the digital societies and proposes action steps towards deepening democracy, deepening the exercise of human rights, and obviously towards uh, bringing uh, the challenges surrounding the struggle for social, gender, and environmental justice. Uh, um, the edition that we are discussing today in this session is part of our broader research, advocacy, and movement building strategy around the intersection of environmental sustainability and digital technologies. And in our work so far, including obviously the research produced here in Gizwatch, is quite illustrative of the complexity of the challenges and issues and how much these issues and challenges are entangled in global capitalism, including the emerging forms of capitalism, like surveillance capitalism, for instance, which really replicate the same patterns of the, of the previous and the current one, the exploitation of extractivism and consumerism. And, and what we have found is that it's not really possible to see the full picture of the impact of digital technologies on our planet, planet, and it seems that it might be perhaps an intentional result of the global system. However, this um, uh, edition with the thematic and country reports contribute, we believe, to provide an updated overview of the current and future challenges and some of the responses to address them, particularly acknowledging that the burden of environmental destruction and pollution falls on communities on communities that are experiencing discrimination, marginalization, and exclusion. And in our work, we have been also 
found that uh, this uh, terrain, the terrain of environmental sustainability, involves contestation for resources, for rights, for territory, for survival, and obviously for profit. And this contestation that puts the notion of, of, of the public what, what in the core, no? what, what's the, the, the public well-being, what's the public good, the, 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 that, that um, um, contestation obviously um, uh, in, in includes decisions that uh, are taken by the different stakeholders and, and how we actually manage this relationship with the environment. So um, uh, obviously for us, it is very clear that these environmental struggles are located in multiple social and economic areas and the actions of the extractive industries, consumerism, corruption, um, policy weakness, poor environmental monitoring, the impact of environmental degradation on human health, even gender-based gender violence, criminal activities such as wildlife trafficking, and also the prohibition of environmental protests. All of these have very, very uh, important and serious social and economic implications. Um, uh, and uh, obviously so far, uh, we have also found that um, this is not only about environmental degradation, but how much such degradation is directly related to the well-being of local communities, especially indigenous and traditional groups. So we are talking here about three intersection issues that have that have to be addressed, the inadequate policy frameworks, unsustainable business models, and lack of holistic and long-term design. So overall, we see that this struggle uh, for environmental and climate justice is multidimensional and multidisciplinary, and that is, at the end of the day, a struggle for human rights, for gender justice, for racial justice, health, and socioeconomic well-being. Um, as I mentioned, this edition of Gizwatch aligns with our broader strategic objectives in APC oriented to contribute to the environmental justice and preservation of the earth and to mitigate the negative environmental impact of the internet and other digital technologies. And we really believe that the IGF can play a very important role in exploring and nurturing a granular understanding of this co-share responsibilities that we all have, that the different stakeholders have, and the policy responses that um, have um, internet governance implications in order to address this environmental and climate crisis. So welcome again to the session, and I will hand over to Alan Finlay, our Gizwatch editor, for, uh, to, who will be introducing our speakers and also facilitating the conversation. So thank you, Mayan. Over to you, Alan. Thank you, Valeria. That was a, a great summary, um, I must say. Many of the issues uh, Valeria spoke about, about are captured in the latest issue of Gizwatch um, uh, in a preliminary way, some of them. Um, and I put the link there in the chat box for anyone who wants to know where to download the Gizwatch. Um, so welcome to our guests. Um, uh, we have five guests here today. Unfortunately, um, one has not been able to make it. Um, uh, but the five guests are going to help us think through some of the complex issues of technology and environmental sustainability from their perspectives. Uh, we have Jennifer Radloff, the Women's Rights Program Coordinator at APC. We have uh, Sabani Banerjee Balur, who represents APC as the Regional Coordinator and in Asia and has a specialization in remote and rural access. We have Martin Devat, a software developer at Greenhost. And we have Michelle Thorne, Senior Program Officer and a Sustainable Internet Lead at the Mozilla Foundation. And we have Narmin Abu Bakari, who is a digital rights campaigner with the Greens and the European Free Alliance Group at the European Parliament. Welcome to you all. Um, how this session will work um, is I will ask uh, Jenny and Sarbani to make some preliminary points and observations to a few general questions. And then I will ask uh, Martin, Michelle and Narmin to respond to any of the points they raise in any way they feel appropriate. After that, we will open the floor to questions for if anyone has questions from the audience. So please, if you would like to ask a question, use the chat box to raise issues or to make observations. 
Jenny, I'm going to leap right into uh, to a feminist perspective on tech and uh, environmental sustainability. Um, it can, for many people, be difficult to understand the role of big technology in the context of the environmental crisis. And certainly, as we know, the examples of technology corporations not taking environmental sustainability very seriously. From a feminist perspective, how do you understand the role of big tech, big tech in the environmental crisis? Um, thanks, Alan. And I took a little bit of liberty and I have uh, kind of, I'm going to respond to the question and, and telling a story and then extrapolating a few things from, from that. So, because um, I think storytelling can be quite powerful. And um, please stop me if I go on too long. And I'm going to read from some notes so I don't forget anything. Um, so, really, um, on reflecting on what to say here, um, prompted by your question, Alan, was realizing how ubiquitous the issue of the climate catastrophe is. Um, so, some of the points may be a bit tangential to the kind of big tech. Um, and I want to start with a personal story and then extrapolate some points from that. Because as a feminist, I believe that the personal is political and that we learn from embodied experience. Um, and also to say that we um, years ago developed the feminist principles of the internet. And I'm wondering if someone could just drop into the chat a link to the FPIs. And we're busy working on a feminist principle of the internet on environment. And um, in the Gizwatch edition is an excellent article by Jess from Circiendo, who are really driving this. Um, so to start with a little story, um, at the age of 17, I, um, and I'm from South Africa, I must say, and I am connecting to the internet or from our um, power producer, ESCOM, who use fossil fuels to power um, our electricity grid. Um, so at the age of 17, I walked the Wild Coast, which is a, an area in South Africa, uh, which under apartheid was the homeland called the Trans Sky. And at one point in this walk, um, we had to hide overnight and then walk at dawn across a stretch of land that had been bought by a white owned company, um, the concession given by the, the government to blast the coast and make an exclusive resort. This impacted the coastal community um, in, in huge ways who it was their ancestral land, many of them subsistence fisher people. So they lost their income and became servants to uh, the resort, losing all their rights in their agency. And I'm speaking to this because the point is power and government collusion in deciding who gets access to resources. Um, and then admitting to my age, at age 60, a few months ago, I walked the same stretch of the wild coast, which is now known and always should have been known as Ponderland. Um, it's a 50 mile stretch of coast, uh, which is now being um, an Australian mining company is wanting to mine this for minerals, which obviously powers is one of the ways that powers our internet. So the community of Zolobeni and other communities along the stretch of pristine wilderness is going to be is going to lose potentially their income. So the Amadeva Crisis Committee, who are resisting this, to date have lost 18 of their activists who have been killed in this resistance. Um, on the 1st of December this year, the Dutch Shell Company have started seismic blasting surveys in the same area during whale breeding season. This has impacted livelihoods, local communities, as well as the precious biodiverse ecosystem. So why the story? Because it speaks to power and marginalization. Um, and it brings out a few points I'd like to highlight in relation to big tech and environmental justice. Um, and also to say that I think as activists, we can both resist and imagine, um, which is the critical point around the feminist principles of the internet, because it actually is imagining an internet that we want and why environmental justice and technology um, is something that we are working on a lot. Um, and also to say that when we talk about big tech, um, it's not just one monolith, and I think we need to be mindful of this, and that there are degrees of culpability in relation to, to this. But um, I want to make five points briefly. The one is colonization. So from the above story, we can see the impact of extractive colonization. 
that communities most affected by this colonization are fighting to preserve ancestral lands against capitalism and extractivism. And a lot of these who are resisting it are women. They bear the brunt of this devastation, while the profits are made by the companies, often not South African companies. Um, and this form of colonization feeds tech industry, who largely rely on fossil fuels. So first point, we need to decolonize not just extractivism, but whose information is being shared by big tech platforms. Second point, time is a construct of exploitation. Uh, big tech thrives on constantly being busy and encourages individual use. Um, this energizes an environment of busyness that does not factor in care and rest, which are key to feminist principles. Um, alternatively, we can share infrastructure, software, and networks through community cooperative services that are based on principles of slowing down and not having 24-7 access. The faster technology moves, the more water is needed to cool data centers, the more energy is needed to power the system, and more waste is produced. Third point, um, and I'm naming this uh, taking from Dr. Safai Noble, the algorithms of oppression. Climate misinformation has a devastating impact on perceptions and behavior, and big tech can be a driver of this misinformation with algor algorithms that are defined by who they are and where they're located. Again, the power that big tech has silences some voices and usually voices with less structural power. And this invariably includes, includes indigenous people, queer people, young people, and people of color. And then a good example of this, which really struck me was the, in terms of marginalization of certain voices, was when a young Ugandan climate activist, Vanessa Nakate, was cut out of a photo taken with other young white activists and uh, other young all white activists in Davos. It's just an example of erasure and silencing, which values some climate justice opinions over others. And we need to be really mindful of this. Fourth point, surveillance technology and environmental justice activists. We know that women human rights defenders um, are usually the most at risk um, in communities who defend land and territories. And we've seen this a lot through um, the Women Human Rights Defenders International Coalition, uh, which APC is part of. And this includes those from communities, like I mentioned, from Tolobeni. Um, and this surveillance technology is developed by big tech companies, sold to governments, and used to monitor and silence um, activists. So this, I think, is an incredibly serious point we need to take into account. And then a fifth point really is looking at the green energy industry, which um, to a point has become the new field for extractivism. So we need to be really careful about that. Um, and then just to end off, um, so those are sites of resistance. So I think it's really important to imagine ways forward. And just a quote from Jess's article in Gizwatch, um, thinking inside of the capitalist framework only enables capitalist solutions. So I think we need to be um, mindful of this. Um, and I think the IGF is a really important space as Valeria has already mentioned, um, where we can engage with digital rights um, activists and bring in um, the voices from the environmental justice community. Um, and then just to finish off, I want to read the start of a principle on a feminist internet um, uh, and the environment. And this is what we've developed thus far. And it reads, a feminist internet respects life in all of its forms. It does not consume it. Our proposal for a feminist internet principle in relation to the environment re-signifies care towards an ethics of collective care in choices around the design, extraction, production, consumption, and disposable of the technologies involved. Um, so thank you for your uh, patience and listening to me, um, and I'll hand back. Thanks, Jenny, that was uh, great, fascinating. Um, uh, Sarbani, you have... Um, you're, of course, the Asia coordinator for, for um, APC, but you also have um, uh, experience in community connectivity. Of course, we know community networks is one form of this. There are other hybrid or, or different kinds of the, different but allied kinds of networks at the local level. 
um, and but they incredibly important to empower most affected uh, communities who are affected by environmental um, uh, and, and problems and 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 extractive industry, for example, or mega government mega projects and climate justice, some of which uh, Jenny spoke to. Um, Jenny suggested also a people and environmental centered approach to connectivity um, rather than the raw market driven solutions that we are mostly offered. What is your perspective on the link between environmental rights, um, human rights and community connectivity? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, and thanks, Maya, for, uh, for inviting uh, me to, uh, to be a speaker. Um, yeah, so I would like to uh, like to mention about um, our work in uh, in APC as part of APC's uh, local uh, network uh, access network project uh, called the LockNet project, and um, we uh, we began in the year actually in the year 2019, uh, which was uh, which which was just uh, before the lockdown and the pandemic began, hit us. Um, and um, we uh, we have set up uh, four community networks in Asia, uh, two in India, one in uh, Myanmar, and one in Indonesia. So in in these community networks that we have set up, uh, we uh, we are not relying completely on connectivity as a medium of uh, uh, as a medium to get connected. So our 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 our, the way we look at connectivity is that it need not be an online connectivity always. It can be an offline connectivity as well. But the most important thing about this connectivity is connectedness amongst the people in the community, uh, in the community that we serve. So this is this is the crux of the of our network, and the network is built on the needs of the community. So if there is a need uh, by the community to set up, um, set up a school um, and get connected uh, through online or offline access, so we, 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 we let them do that. So it is sort of a, uh, it's a sort of an open playing ground for everyone, the communities to decide how they would like to set up the, the network and for what purpose. Now, um, most of these uh, community networks organizations with whom we work, not only in Asia, but in Latin America and in Africa, are organizations that work with remote rural uh, areas where the telecom infrastructure reach is sort of very less because of uh, low revenue per user and things of that sort. Now, in, in most of the cases, in most of the organizations, what we find is that the connectivity needs has been directly related to environmental sustainability and environment preser environmental preservation and conservation. Let me give you examples of the work that we have done. Um, in India, there are two community networks that we have seeded to grow, one, in, uh, one, one very close by to Mumbai, to give you a context of the space. Um, and another one, um, 50 kilometers away from Bangalore. Bangalore is the location where another community network has been set up. Now, in the community network where we seeded to grow nearby to Mumbai, um, is a location where uh, indigenous tribes are located. And they did not have, they have a lot of local knowledge about the, the, the biodiversity around them. They exactly know where is the tree, which tree is where, which tree gives fruit at what time of the year. Everything is known to them. And uh, they did not have a repository of that knowledge. So that knowledge has been passed down generation after generation um, by word of mouth. So their need was to preserve their environment, environment around them, the biodiversity around them, and work through um, work through uh, creating a local knowledge repository, which is called the biodiversity sharing platform, which has been knowledge sharing platform, which has been made, uh, which we created as part of the APC's funded project. Um, we created this platform for them, and in this platform, the communities come together 
in an offline network, in an offline mesh network, uh, through the phones that they have, they either record uh, interviews with uh, community members or click photographs. If they have a smartphone, they click photographs uh, of the different types of uh, uh, biodiversity, flora and fauna around them. And um, they upload in the local access server. So this has created a local uh, knowledge repository of theirs, which is very essential and was the need of the community. And now the question comes that we can't just talk about environmental sustainability without even uplifting their livelihood, uh, their standard of living. So what has been done is that this biodiversity knowledge, uh, the knowledge sharing platform, which has been created, is also linked to an e-commerce platform, which we have made available for them. And the products, some of the products that are not perishable products, are sold online in that e-commerce platform. And the proceeds go directly to them in the community. This is, this is one thing, and the, and the report is uh, on this community network that uh, uh, we worked on together with APC's funding. Now, there are other community networks where in Indonesia, I would like to mention this community network by Common Group, which works on uh, environmental sustainability of paddy cultivation. And this is a location where the paddy, they, their main uh, sustenance is through paddy cultivation. And how they link up that local knowledge building on paddy um, that they have various, uh, I think 52 varieties of paddy or rice is grown in that location. And they have that knowledge uh, repository made in, the, in, the, in that platform. Then I'll tell you about this Myanmar community network. And in this community network, they work a lot on coffee estates. And coffee is something that they grow and they want to, they want, they use the internet for, uh, for extracting more information about different types of um, uh, uh, different flavors of uh, uh, honey made out of, uh, made uh, from the bees that are there around and how they can make different types of wine out of it, which is, you know, this is the, this is the environment that they live in. So, so most of our projects as part of APC's DocNet project has been working around these, uh, these uh, frugal technologies and through these frugal technologies, how communities can work together uh, to preserve their, uh, the biodiversity in which they live in. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Savani. Um, um, it's quite interesting that, uh, I mean, from my perspective, and I may be wrong, but in, in Asia, there's a lot of linking between uh, productivity and local knowledge and biodiversity and conservation, whereas in um, LAC, there's a lot more to do with sort of taking on the extractive industries, protecting indigenous land from the invasion of, of businesses and illegal uh, miners and so on. So there does seem to be quite a, a distinct difference at the local level going on in the two continents. Um, it's also interesting to see that uh, you were talking about being offline and um, uh, Jenny was talking more or less about slowing things down and, and also being offline. It does seem that the sort of the idea of a right, the right to be offline is, is central to, to taking on the environmental crisis. Michelle, um, from the Mozilla Foundation's perspective, I'm not sure if there were any particular points you'd like to follow up on or something was quite, you found structure is quite interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. And also thank you to um, APC for having this on the agenda and, and for the two panels who've spoken so far. Um, I really wanted to um, help to uplift and underscore the points that have been mentioned that were also, also covered in the Gifts Watch report. Um, and I think particularly also to just say, recognize and say thank you also to APC. We've been covering this topic for at least 10 years with your report from before. Um, and I would like to just add maybe a some perspectives or one ways we can kind of continue to talk about this. Um, so one of the phrases, or at least the, I'm interested in testing with you all is, what does it look like to talk about a fossil free internet? And how might we get there by something like 2030? Um, I think this question, I'd love to hear feedback also from the APC community, whether setting a kind of goal like that, that seems measurable and achievable would be a way for us to make 
clear progress on these issues, knowing that, of course, there are much more and bigger systemic pieces to pick on. But um, that would be one thing I'd love to hear people's uh, feedback on, a fossil-free internet by 2030. Um, and secondly, many um, the panels have spoken about the importance of understanding big tech and its role um, in extractivism. I would also highlight the role big tech plays in selling its technology to speed up the extraction of fossil fuels and how that's becoming increasingly a topic even amongst the workers that um, that work for those companies. So I guess and a question that also had <laughs> to ask this group is: Does the idea of divesting from big tech? resonate and how might that also help play into kind of an advocacy narrative, um, both divesting in terms of moving finances, um, but also our attention, our time and our infrastructure um, away from big tech. Um, and then lastly, another idea I wanted to share with you all or ask for how it, how it resonates is um, at least the way that I've seen some of these topics brought up in the tech sector is really focusing on emissions, greenhouse gas, um, gases, and while that's a really important step, especially when we talk about climate change, how might we be shifting the conversation to not only talk about emissions when we look at this intersection, but really putting people at the heart um, and the people most affected um, by climate change at the heart. So how can we ensure climate justice becomes um, something that's more widely understood and acted upon within the tech sector? Um, so thank you. Those, I hope that's a helpful addition to uh, Alan. Um, but yes, would love to hear people's thought on this idea of a fossil-free internet by 2030, divesting from big tech, and centering climate justice in the tech sector. Just a, thanks, Michelle. Just a clarity: divesting from big tech. Do you mean? I mean, okay. So you you wouldn't literally in the stock market you wouldn't buy the shares and all that kind of stuff. But what else do you mean practically? Just just for my purpose for clarity. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there's a definitely the financial mechanisms are riffing on the divestment movement in general, which is like a, many, there's a lot of money being made by in big tech stocks, and they're often seen as clean and green stocks. So maybe there's ways for us to question that and also uh, ensure investments from various institutions um, reevaluate. Um, but I also think that means divestment in different ways. Where Where is our data living? What services are we using? What platforms? Um, and so that part of that divestment means also shifting resources to build alternatives that are sustainable, inclusive, and just. So I would just wanted to, this is a very new concept, that, at least for me. So I'm curious how, if this resonates with people or if there's ways we could build on that kind of advocacy approach. Thank you, thank you, very interesting. Um, I'll take comments from Narmin and Martin first, and then we can open it up for discussion around the various points you raised, if that's fine. Narmin, uh, from your side, I mean, was there anything in particular that you found interesting from what anyone said so far? Yes, completely. Um, <clears throat> what I found uh, super interesting is uh, the impact that it has on uh, the extraction um, extraction and mining on um, communities um, and on women particularly. So we recently published um, a study that uh, really looks into um, the impact that uh, tech can have on the environment. And one of them is, uh, one of uh, the biggest of it is uh, actually the manufacturing, um, which also includes um, the extraction. So um, having that in mind, knowing that 71% um, of the impact is caused during that phase, um, remind us of um, the importance of having products that is not being produced, but try to get fewer products to that extent. So um, the the repair, the reuse um, perspective is really important because it really um, actually reflects how we could uh, ensure that these communities are not being impacted that much. So <clears throat> it sounds like it's uh, not really linked to the feminist, but also um, the decon decolonialism um, but in fact I think it's one way of also trying to have a more ethic tech um, a respectful and um, sustainable one um, um, thinking also about um, that um, the use of tech just uh, in general uh, this is a uh, one of the second impact that um, we see on the environment um, and I, I I strongly believe that um, and providing ways for people to um, not overspend time on the phone and um, creating um, 
stopping the incentive of um, spending more time, spending more um, uh, more energy would be also a way of um, um, of uh, protecting our planet in a way. And I could uh, also share the um, the study because it comes from um, it uh, really tries to goes into a life cycle assessment of. Uh, of the impact of environmental tech, uh, meaning that it goes at every different phases um, and try to see where ethic and sustainability um, can be put into account or rethink as well. So um, yeah, definitely sharing it uh, not right now in the chat. Thanks, Don. I mean, I'm just because I'm, uh, I don't know, it's obviously, you know, from Southern Africa, for example, we see the Green Party doing very well in Germany, and you obviously uh, represent the, the Greens in the European uh, uh, Parliament. Uh, how seriously is the issue of the impact of technology on the environment, the negative side of the dark side of technology taken in Europe amongst uh, uh, you know, environmentally conscious people? So the European Commission, I mean, when it started its mandate in 2019, um, emphasized the importance of having more digital technology uh, while protecting the climate. So the perspective on it has been so far, we want more tech and tech will save the planet, um, which is not entirely wrong. Um, it could help us, um, but since it's not assessing the real environmental impact, um the outcome would not be that beneficial for the planet and for the people um at the end um and i think this perspective has um, been really amplified so far by this um this race towards different countries and um, the uh, willingness to be um, sovereign um, also from China, which also make European countries invest even more in technologies, but um, energy consuming technologies. Um, and <clears throat> however, it doesn't mean that it hasn't taken into account. It has only taken um, by the European European politicians from a more right to repair perspective. So the European Commission is going to propose different legislative proposals um, too. Normally was supposed to be published um, in December, um, one called a sustainable product initiative, um, a, a circular um, um, electronic initiative as well. And those um, policy, uh, policy um, legislation aims to reduce the amount of e-waste um, that European countries are producing. But since it only takes into account only the reparability aspect, um, it's, um, it is not good enough to at least minimize the environmental impact of digital technologies. Now, um, we've decided to produce that study um, also because we've seen that the lake of data um, is enormous. Um, we um, we have um, difficulties uh, within the European Union to have um, consensus information um, on the um, real cost and real environmental impact and health impact of digital technology. Um, and this is why we strongly, um, we the Greens, believe that we should have not only a scientific observer observatory and committee board, um, discussing this information and this data, but to also make um, environmental labeling mandatory um, and have a methodology that is the same among the European countries. Um, and um, this is what we're trying to achieve. And we really hope that this study will also um, shift the perspective on um, the importance of um, really having the data, but also assessing um, the impact at every stage. So it's not only about the use and the e-waste that we are creating, it's also about the energy consumption of our manufacturing, um, and also uh, of our data center. So at every stage, um, we have to think about um, the rebound effects um, and the, the different impact that it could cause. Um, and this is something that we, we hope the European Commission will take into account in the future. Um, but at the moment, we're not there yet. There are a lot of promises um, with, um, with little, um, little um, I would say, potential interesting policy recommendation. So we hope that study will be at least a start, um, a start and also a basis of discussion uh, with other political groups as well. So. 
I mean, you raised the critical point of uh, uh, data, for, um, and that's a problem all around the world, and it's been raised many times in some of the GizWatch reports, um, and particularly local data, evidence-based data to drive local policy decisions as opposed to leaning on global data um, production for local uh, policy decisions. So this is a, a, a growing problem, I would say, in, the, in environmental sustainability and justice. Um, Martin, Martin, if we can turn to you, I mean, was there any particular point you want to comment on? And also, if you could just tell us briefly a little bit about Greenhost. resonates with me completely. Uh, and I want to lead with that also because I like to find the places where I disagree rather than trying to say everything again, uh, but in a different way. Um, so first, uh, I think I'm the only one in the in the panel that's um, from a commercial company. So I, uh, I really appreciate the critique on uh, capitalism. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I share the critique as well. Um, but something that Jenny said resonated with me. Um, it was that uh, thinking inside a capitalist framework only brings capitalist solutions. Um, and as green hosts, uh, this is something that we are trying to do. So we, um, yeah, I'm. I think I'll just try to explain what we're trying to do. And I would hope that Jenny has some time to respond to that uh, as well. Um, so uh, as a company, we try to keep our income uh, uh, partly from a commercial customers that want to host their websites on the internet. And wh what we do for them, uh, as well as for all our other projects, is we try to do that as sustainably as possible. Uh, so first, uh, to do anything sustainably uh, on the internet, first thing you need to consider is reducing the footprint or the whatever it is you're trying to do. So uh, that means, for example, that several customers that host websites with us would be hosted on the same virtual machine that would share a virtual machine with a bunch of other, uh, 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 or would share a, an actual machine with a bunch of other customers on different virtual machines. So we're trying to cram as, as much uh, processing power into one server as we can. Um, this, is, this is a common practice, but it's also a sustainable practice. Um, and then on top of that, of course, to make everything we do sustainable, we need to do it on green energy, um and uh, like a last bit of what we're trying to do is also make our office sustainable so we get secondhand furniture we uh, eat a vegetarian and vegan uh, organic lunch and that kind of stuff but that's really a small part of the footprint of the company as a whole in the end um what i think really makes greenhouse a different company from uh, other tech companies or other internet companies is actually not this. Any, any company can, um, like most companies, try to reduce their CPU usage or memory usage or electricity usage as, as a whole to a minimum, uh, at least to like reduce cost. And uh, if everything you do is run servers, that, that is like the, ma the majority of the costs. Um, it's also not very expensive to switch to green electricity rather than, um, um, well, what we call gray electricity, like coal powered electricity, especially for Europe based companies like ours. Um, but, um, uh, and at the same time, when you do, it's something that you can use for marketing, right? It's we, We've seen ads from Google or, or Microsoft saying that everything they do is, is, is completely um, uh, sustainable. So you shouldn't worry about uh, using their services, right? Um, so then what is it that sets us apart? And that's, uh, I think that we don't, even though we are a commercial company, we don't prioritize income 
uh, we don't prioritize money as uh, as a goal. So especially in the capitalist system, that is supposed to be the like what you do, right? Especially if you have stakeholders, we are not uh, we we don't sell uh, um, stocks. We are not on that market. It's a, one of the decisions we've made to make sure that we don't put money first, but we try to put people first. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means that we have a special uh, hosting cluster only for um, social good projects that don't have to pay us anything. And the money to do that comes uh, either from uh, uh, funders that, that are part of our community, uh, or if that would not be possible, we would still try to keep that alive uh, from our, um, our commercial income. Uh, we also try to do projects um, like the ones that I'm currently involved with um, called Stackspin, uh, where we want to make an alternative, a viable alternative to, for example, Google and Microsoft projects. So you, you can uh, drop out of the Google Docs thing that everybody loves and everybody wants to use. But in the end, it's powered by big tech, by a company that just wants to make you addicted to their product, so you will use it more. Um, and I think it's a good thing that we try to do that. And I think it's also a good thing that we are a commercial company, because if we weren't, um, I really doubt if we would have the means to sustain these projects. Uh, and I also doubt if we would get the funding that we do for, for especially these uh, social good project because we cannot promise the funder like after we finish the project we will maintain it uh, it's it's really not uh, an easy sell if you cannot say you have like a standard source of income um, to to maintain whatever you're trying to make thanks martin uh, just a question that the, the uh, michelle Raise the idea of a fossil-free internet by 2030. I mean, amongst amongst uh, the people you work with, anyway, in, in the business sector, I mean, do, is that something that people are talking about, going green, um, moving away from fossil fuels, or is it a relatively new idea amongst, for example, pocket of people like yourself? I think it's something that's uh, uh, talked about, especially in the public-facing uh, part of the internet, let's say. So for example, we as Greenhouse, we have our servers, uh, we have uh, switches and those are connected to the Amsterdam internet exchange. That means that everything you do with us uh, runs on sustainable energy, um, but the internet is not just our servers. Uh, everything that, that is connected between our servers and your computer, um, is sort of a black box for most people. And a lot of energy consumption uh, goes there too, but those are not, uh, we don't get to choose those companies. Uh, most people don't get to choose, for example, their own internet service provider and the infrastructure in between is also not very, um, well, it's just one company per, per country uh, often. Um, and, I cannot say for sure. I, I, I don't know what kind of electricity those run on, but I can say that they have less incentive to uh, to switch to, to fossil-free uh, electricity. And then like to get a fossil-free internet, I know that, for example, Google and Microsoft are uh, uh, really focusing on trying to make their services fossil-free. As far as I know, Google even is. It has a lot of their own solar solar panel parks. Uh, but at the same time, I know that, for example, Microsoft wants it, uh, is, is still in the process. And they've built this huge uh, uh, windmill park uh, here in the Netherlands, which is great. Uh, the fact that their servers that are also going to be here in the Netherlands will be wind powered is great. But at the same time, the fact that this huge uh, company paid for all these, um, actually didn't pay for all these windmills, uh, but that's a different problem. Uh, 
makes it harder for a lot of other places in the Netherlands to move away from fossil fuel. So although I do really like the idea of a fossil free internet, um, the, uh, we should be striving towards a fossil free world, right? And prioritizing the internet over anything else. Um, yeah, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't go at a cost of other things that should also become fossil free. Thank you. But, um, Jenny, Martin sort of wanted to open up to you from his comments around the, the question is obviously a big one, but, but he was saying clearly that agents can be agents of change within a kind of business capitalist environment. Um, yeah, and, and I completely yeah. agree with you, Martin. And I think that, um, I mean, that comment comes from um, some of the discussions we've been having about imagining a feminist principle on the environment. And one comment that came through is, we shouldn't be talking about sustainability, we should be talking about decolonization. And I think I really like these, these um, radical inputs, because then it broadens our thinking and it broadens our um, ability to resist what we're trying to resist. Um, so I completely agree with, with um, what you're saying about um, making other choices um, other than Google. And I mean, APC has been trying to do that since forever, since we started, you know, kind of promoting free and open source software. And it becomes really complicated. Um, and we found this in, in our feminist activism is often communities we work with are just given, a, a, you know, a laptop that is already has Microsoft. So to try and shift to other things is difficult. But I think also what we've learned in imagining a feminist internet is to think out of the box. So it, it, it pushes towards, um, towards those alternatives. And yes, we work within a capitalist system. And yes, you know, I'm a vegan, but I get a lot of flack from you know, friends because I'm middle class, I can af afford it. Whereas the communities I was walking in recently, you know, they, they don't use energy, um, much energy, they, um, food choices are limited, um, the food choices are sustainable. So it, it depends on what lens you're looking through and where you're located. And I think that's why these conversations are so critical and why as digital rights activists, we need to, um, to bring in environmental activists. And I also agree that a fossil free internet, let's work towards it and that will be one aspect of a fossil free world. Um, but I think what, what this conversation has, has given me is a sense that there are people that want to imagine something different. And um, we have got to start playing with those differences and, and um, imagining. Um, and, and Martin, I would totally use your services. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for that. Sarbani, um, just a, uh, I'm curious. So um, community networks, if they work on sustainable energy, they use solar panels and so on, um, uh, the, is, is that just the community waiting for development to come to them? I mean, if the, if the electricity came tomorrow, would they all just plug it in? Or is it just, an, or is it something that genuinely those communities believe in? I mean, from the tech perspective I'm talking about. Uh, yes. Um, so from the tech perspective, I would like to mention that uh, here in these uh, remote, uh, in these communities that we work on, they would like to work a lot on frugal technologies technologies and i i i really feel that uh, we the technology development should should not lead into standardization for um, for rural com communities or rural connectivity because i feel standardization uh, standardization is only one way of technology development that can just lead lead to a roadblock and um, for rural communities or rural communication for example the need for technology diversification technology expansion has to be very crucial um, crucial decision making of the communities themselves we just can't because are we thinking about how much of uh, power, uh, how much of electricity are we saving when we switch on these devices in the rural areas? Or are we thinking that um, can a local entrepreneur or a local technician 
um, come uh, become available when these devices uh, are switched on and deployed in the rural areas and they are not uh, because once it goes down um it is either thrown away or it is not used at all because there is no capacity building in the in the in these remote villages where people can uh, can tinker about with the device and try to repair it that is not happening so rather than rather than going on the way or the direction of standardization i would say that we should go into this uh, in the direction of localization of technologies and where the role of frugal and foundational technologies are very important because because like for example i here i would like to state about the use case of libre router for example libre router is an open source hardware router and the very vision of this router has been that it can travel from one country to the other and get customized according to the needs of that uh, of that country or the rural communities in that country and um, nothing is closed source in that everything is open source and um, thanks so sir we're just running a little bit out of yeah. time and i just wanted yeah. so thank you very much i'm sorry to interrupt you uh, 30 seconds, sorry, Silvani, so 30 seconds, Michelle and Narmin, if you want to just make a comment at the end. Oh, sure, yeah, thank you for making the space to uh, advance these issues and also for working on them for so long. Um, and I really think, yes, let's work together towards a fossil free and just internet uh, together that's in service to a larger <laughs> transition uh, um, for the world. Um, and let's build these alternatives that we're talking about, um, divesting from big tech, but investing in local, sustainable, inclusive solutions. Yeah, thank you for, for this great panel. Uh, Namin, final comments from you? Yeah, thanks a lot as well. I um, I really appreciate this conversation, especially when from a legislative perspective, we um, sometimes don't have um, the perspective of the people on the ground. Um, we don't want to have a legislation that only impacts the European Union, obviously, um, because um, it's a global problem. The current problem is not uh, only um, affecting our European citizens, but uh, everyone across um, the world. So having this discussion and following up with you um, is um, is really important um, because we do want to take that reflects um, the, the fields, the impacts on uh, on women, on different communities. Um, and uh, I'll be more than happy to um, touch base later on how we can build that uh, ethical, sustainable tech uh, later. And thanks again. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I really appreciate you, your participation. Maya, um, would you like to um, close? Sure, just a, a big round of thanks to all of our participants here and everybody for connecting with us. This is really um, a valuable um, meeting space, I think, for all of us and for all your voices to come together. And we really appreciate your time. And uh, I've reposted in the chat the link to the full GISWATCH report. So you can download that online if you haven't taken a look yet and find all the reports in there. It's a really great resource. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing this conversation with everybody. Thank you so much.